Hey guys, Jeff Sparks with Between Paint. Today we're coming back to uh, part two of the Paris Critique, where I've looked at a painting of a Paris bistro scene. Our first video, we, if you remember, we took uh, a look at the horizon line and the perspective. Today we're going to look at the focal point, color temperature, and the palette adjustments necessary to really help make a painting read. Well, just so you know, the focal point really will not have a lot to do with this, because if you apply everything else in these two videos, your focal point will really command the attention it deserves. I'll say a bit about it at the very end, but not much. And again, the reason for that is because all of these other elements are in submission to your focal point. So it's a given you have a focus area in your painting. Now, how to make that really pop? So we're going to talk about that today with these other points, color temperature and palette adjustment. But the problem that we usually have is that we think of any situation in terms of color when it comes to a color wheel. But we need to take a detour for a moment away from the critique and cover the biggest painting misconception that exists in, in the painter's world. And that is using color temperature is somehow connected to the color wheel. Well, here is the color wheel. You can see that there's a warm side and a cool side. Now, when it comes to color temperature, you need to throw all of this information away. It's completely irrelevant in your painting. So I have this picture of a color wheel here to remind you to now never think about it again, at least in terms of color temperature. The color wheel has nothing to do with color temperature. So when you're using the terminology, a cool shadow or a warm highlight, you're not talking about the color wheel at all. So I'm going to move to the next slide and show you what I mean. I call this the three swatch lesson. Now, if you can imagine, this myth is so prevalent, it's in almost every book you can read that's on a more basic level. You hear it talked about by other artists, and it's a tremendous misconception that in a painting there are warm and cool colors. That's a myth. The truth is that in a painting, a color is only warmer than or cooler than some other color. If you try to think like a color wheel, this can be detrimental to your painting. We've been told all of our lives that some colors are cool and some are warms, but that is misleading completely. Colors in a painting do not exist in isolation. It's not that simple. So there is no such thing as warm and cool colors, and I repeat, you have warmer than or cooler than some other color. And that's the truth of this lesson, and so let's look at this in a little more detail. Pretend for a moment that the central swatch where the arrow's pointing is your color. And the color, for some reason or another, needs to be cooled. You have two things you can do to make other elements of this color recede and make the actual color itself advance toward the viewer. Now, you have to do that in a painting or you'll have no volume. And you use color to do that, uh, color temperature to do that. But there's two ways to do it. To the left, you can see the, the words desaturate. Well, we can take out some of the color saturation, and that will make something recede. Or to the right, we can actually cool it. And that also will help make something visually recede. But do you notice something special here? There is absolutely no hint of an arbitrary cool color. And yet, I've done exactly that very thing. I've pushed both of the sides back by either, either desaturating this or cooling it. Now, you can even do it and push it a little further. For instance, here I've, done, I've taken the same central swatch, desaturated it a little more on the left side, and cooled it down on the left side. But when you look at that cool color or the desaturated color, your mind does not automatically see a cool color a cooler than or warmer than color. And that's what would, that's the whole art of color temperature, and it's so often missed in a painting. Anytime you look at a painting and you see that the shadows automatically recede into a bluish color, you can tell that that artist has not yet understood this principle. And that's okay, because it's hard to find anyone that can tell you about it. Um, I learned this from a guy named Howard Friedland, a really great artist, a master 
artist. Uh, and so he taught this too, that it's never cool versus warm, but cooler than and warmer than. Well, let's what, see what happens when we push this a little further. Now, I still have the same central swatch. The color hasn't been changed. But to the left, I've desaturated almost completely. And to the right, I've pushed it to an even cooler color. Now, the values, if you've noticed, on all three of these are reading exactly the same. So let's lay all those colors out. There's that, that same central watch as indicated by the arrow. To the left are all of those movements toward desaturation. And to the right are those movements toward cool. Now, a couple things you should, you should see about this right away. Isn't this a beautiful color harmony? And not only that, the value of these colors, the lightness, relative lightness or darkness, has remained exactly the same. But you can still see that central swatch is what comes forward while these other colors are receding, either through desaturation or moving it gently toward cool. But here's what normally happens. This is what you normally see in a painting where an artist has not figured out the art of color temperature and how to use it in their painting. You look at this and you start to think like a color wheel. And when you start thinking like a color wheel, it begins to throw off all of your colors. We start with our local color in the center under the arrow. But then the first thing we'll do to the upper left, we'll pick a cool color that is lighter in value so it emphasizes that we are pushing it back in space, but the color is still arbitrarily cool. Well, the second thing we can do is we keep the value absolutely the same, but then we arbitrarily pick a cool color and try to push that color into uh, recession as well. And un especially when you're working in shadow, number three is what happens probably most often. You darken the value and arbitrarily pick a cool color to push it back. So these are the main errors you can make in color temperature. But after this video, I hope you never make them again because I think your painting will become so much stronger. So as a way to help remember that, here's a mantra, a mantra I'd like us to remember. In painting, color temperature is not concerned with warm colors and cool colors. Rather, color temperature is concerned with colors that are warmer than and cooler than some other color. So keep that in mind. Now let's turn back to the artist's painting and apply this. As you see here, we're looking at this photo reference again. I have uh, used Photoshop and I've come up with the three main color groups of this painting. Uh, and it's really great. From the photo reference itself, you have uh, th a nice little palette going on here. You have groups of uh, three colors. At the top, you have the reddish group, which is part of the awning. To the right, you have the cooler bluish group, which is part of the street scene. And here up front, at the very bottom of the painting, in the foreground, you have the concrete and some of these other elements. And you can really see this beautiful palette uh, has emerged. Um, I think this is one of the reasons the painting was probably attractive to the artist, Susan Wilson. And uh, this color arrangement is really fantastic. Now, if I did this for the reference photo, um, I look at this also now in black and white, in, in shades of gray. And you can see that it's, uh, the values are uh, really close. It looks really sharp. And so even in grayscale, the reference photo is looking pretty good. Now let's turn our attention back to Susan's painting. Now. Now here we begin to see something that uh, we have questions about, like can we uh, maybe work with her color arrangement a little bit to help make whatever her focal area is really stand out uh, without the wrong elements standing out. So, so here to your right you have those same street elements and to the left I've put the awning next to those uh, street elements. Now the colors are still really nice and she has a great color sense and great color arrangement. Um, I do see a lot of saturation going into uh, the reds particularly and it's really causing that awning to pop out and again as we talked in our last video maybe that's what you want to have happen maybe not and if not then we want to probably tone down and desaturate these colors a little bit. So as we're looking at that let's move further now and uh, if let me actually pop that last screen up. So if you look to the right, 
Susan's done a masterful job moving this painting back through space. And you see the colors, uh, starting with the very bottom, you have these colors marching back in space down that street. That's what all those blue colors represent. It's marching back into her painting. Now to do the same thing with the uh, reference here, um, I'm, I'm looking back and you see the shadow of the lamppost, by the way, how cool that shadow is. Well, let's look what's really happening. Here you have that very thing, the concrete in the front with the shadow. Now they're not anywhere near as cool as they're painted, which is fine, but that might not be a necessity to arbitrarily use a bluish color to make a shadow. And this is what I'm getting at with color temperature. If we think like a color wheel, we're going to say a shadow is always cooler than that which is around it. We know that. But we don't want to necessarily think of it as a color that needs to be cool, but that the the uh, it's cooler than whatever is in light right next to it. So we have that with the concrete and shadow. And I also saw these little white crossing stripes. And that's what the uh, upper arrow is there. It's relatively white. And so you have the shadow that lays on it is so much uh, warmer. There's really no blue at all in there. We're talking in uh, shades of gray, actually. So Moving back up to this painting, one of the things that can really help this painting read stronger and give it a better sense of depth perception is to, in fact, not be using cool colors in shadows that are close, but cooler than colors. And, and that can really help make a painting stand out. Now, the next thing, too, let's look at this in a different way. I'm looking at the street scene as that street angles back to the right central part of the painting. Uh, we have something called aerial perspective in play. Now, all aerial perspective is, and many of you know what that term means, and that is there is uh, water vapor in the air, and more particles are absorbed by the water vapor the further into a scene or into the, the world our, our eyes go. Now, that produces a, a sort of effect, and to do a good painting, we mimic that effect. Now, in this photograph, you can see at the top right the effect of aerial perspective in just the shadows alone. Just the shadows. Now, the first circle at the bottom, the forefront, the four circle, that's actually the concrete in light. Okay, so that is the one that is in light. And then I chose uh, to those colors as you stepped back in those shadows in space all the way to the very next bit of light concrete. And do you see what's happening? There's a warmth to even the shadows up front and a darkness as well, a sort of darkening of value. But as you step back, they become cooler than that dark color. And they march cooler and cooler and lighter and lighter. But they don't really get to a deep or pronounced blue. They're still very muted until that very far bit of concrete, there's light again. Now I took that swatch, moved it around back to the bottom, and look at what happens. The foreground concrete is sitting in the same sunlight as the background concrete. But thanks to aerial perspective, look at the difference between those two, the fore and the back. And so what's happening in that painting is very key when you're trying to produce this effect in your own work. Basically, lesson one, less warm does not equal more cool. And that's the principle I want you to draw out of this uh, color temperature lesson. Making something in shadow has nothing to do with it becoming cool, just less warm or cooler than. So again, we're using that terminology. Excuse me. Now, I would say that at some point in the very far distance, colors, in fact, do become quite cool. This is really involved with mountains in a far distance. And unless you're painting a mountain vista, uh, it's so easy to overplay this color uh, temperature. And so you always want to keep it a little closer, play it a little closer to um, uh, the scene, and realize they're going to be muted colors you're working with in shadow. And also that aerial perspective changes it, but not that much. It has an effect, but not a great effect. So let's move to the next slide where I'm going to point out something else. As these colors in aerial perspective are marching back down the street, 
have you ever asked yourself the question, why in fact are shadows cool to begin with? Why are they cooler than other objects? Well, think about it. In this painting, shadows are not voids of pure black. You can see into them and there's they're well lit shadows. So there must be light entering in there somewhere. But where does that light come from? So it's very important to remember that in each outdoor painting, you have three light sources you want to contend with. The warmer direct light from the sun, of course, the cool ambient light from the sky. And this is the, the light, this is the reason why shadows are cool, because you have ambient skylight falling into them. But you also have a third source of light, and that's bounced or reflected light, which frankly can do absolutely anything to your painting, and uh, you always want to keep that in mind. So back to Susan's painting, as we look at that now, you can see that by by lowering some of the coolness in the forefront of her painting and uh, warming it up a little bit and lightening the values as things move back, you could probably create a tremendous more sense of depth in this painting, and that's what I'd certainly be thinking about here. Color temperature, again, has nothing to do with the color wheel, and that's what I, again, want to review with us. Color temperature is about relationships. We ask not if a color is cool or warm, but cooler than or warmer than some other color. And finally, we never want to forget that color temperature changes as the viewer moves further into the painting. But be careful not to overemphasize that. It's like power you, are, you have been given in your painting. And playing with that power is important. With these things we've talked about in both visit videos, you have tremendous power to take your focal point and put these elements in submission to it. Now, it's simple, but it's not easy. So I encourage you to rewatch these videos until these concepts become quite clear and easy for you when you look at your next set of paintings. So hey, I hope this has been very instructive for you. It's been a great instruction for me as well because I struggle with the same things you do in my own paintings. And constantly keeping this in front of me and reminding my own self um, it saves and salvages a lot of paintings and helps them be stronger. It'll do the same with yours. So again, this is Jeff Sparks at Between Paint. If you love this video, if you like what you're learning, please share it. I need all the help I can get getting the word out. So you guys take care, and until next time, happy painting.